I will go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, he doesn't need a lot of introduction, but for those of you who have not yet heard of him, he is uh, Michael Clare, and he is the Five College Professor of Peace and World Security Studies, which is a joint appointment at Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges and the University of Massachusetts and Amherst, and director of the Five College Program in Peace and World Security Studies, positions he has held since 1985. Professor Clare has written widely on U.S. defense policy, the arms trade, and global resource politics. He's the author of several books, including most recently, and the one you saw at the, uh, that's being displayed at the reception, The Race for What's Left, The Global Scramble for the World's Last Resources, uh, Rising Power, Shrinking Planet, The New Geopolitics of Energy, Blood and Oil, The Dangers and Consequences of America's Growing Dependency on Important Petroleum, and Resource Wars. He has contributed articles to these journals and many others, including Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Harper's, Newsweek, and Scientific American. Professor Clare is the defense correspondent of The Nation magazine and is a contributing editor to Current History. He also serves on the board of directors of the Arms Control Association and the National Priorities Project. Please help me in welcoming Professor Clare. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you. I've gotten a very nice, warm welcome here at the University of New England, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm very fond of Portland, Portland, Maine. Uh, this is the first time I've been at this campus, but I've been a guest before of the World Affairs Council in Portland, so I'm really, truly happy to be here this evening. And I'm going to speak about what I learned, uh, what I discovered in the process of writing my latest book, The Race for What's Left, and where, it's, where it has led me. And uh, see what, if you find that interesting. And I'm certainly looking forward when I'm done to the questions that you have and whatever, whatever um, thoughts this might bring up to you. Uh, so let me proceed. When I started out writing this book about four or five years ago, what I expected it, it would turn out to be is a saga of environmental devastation, a report on the corporate assault on the world's last resource preserves, right, which, by which I mean the, the parts of the world that have up until now largely escaped predation by the major resource corporations. Uh, the deep oceans, the Arctic, Siberia, the inner Amazon, and so forth. Uh, in particular, I aim to show how the depletion of existing resource preserves, the places that have been in production for a very long time, uh, is leading to a drive, a, a mammoth drive, an accelerated drive, to, to invade and to exploit what remains of the world's vital resources. And, and here, I'm, what I'm talking about is energy resources, oil, natural gas, coal, uranium, uh, and so on, as well as all the minerals we need for our industrial civilization, and basic things like water and land and food. And in fact, if you read my book, The Race for What's Left, you will find many, many examples of this kind of invasion. Indeed, the many, the, the major, what they, what an industry is called extractive industries, mining companies, timber companies, oil and natural gas companies, coal companies, are engaged in a systematic assault on the world's remaining resource preserves. This summer, for example, one of the areas I highlight is the Arctic. And this summer probably witnessed the most intense assault on the Arctic ever conducted by the, the extractive industries. Royal Dutch Shell uh, began uh, a very intensive drive to extract oil and, and natural gas from the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea. These are the parts of the Arctic Ocean that touch on Alaska. Uh, meanwhile, Russian companies, in conjunction with, uh, with Western companies, began to 
survey waters in the Kara Sea, part of the Arctic uh, off of Russia, and Norwegian companies are drilling in the uh, Barents Sea off of northern Norway, and mining companies began exploration of Greenland because of the melting of the ice cap. Greenland has become accessible to mining. So there's this systematic assault on the resources of the Arctic. And as I expected, this assault has terrifying consequences for the environments in which these activities are taking place. Most of these areas harbor endangered species, which are at risk in the Arctic, in Siberia. Uh, the species that live there are already living at the very margins of existence. They've been you know, de developed over many millennia to survive in very remote and difficult areas. When you introduce mining or drilling and you have accidents and toxins enter into the environment, these species are immediately at extreme risk. These areas also harbor, in the, whether the Arctic or Siberia or the inner Amazon, what's the, the last reserves in Africa, uh, harbor the last remaining indigenous peoples who practice a traditional way of life, the Laps, the Inuit, and their brethren, and the indigenous tribes of the Amazon. All of these last remaining peoples who still practice a hunter-gatherer type existence are, uh, are uh, at extreme risk uh, because of the mining that's going to take place or the drilling um, and the threat to the creatures that inhabit these areas or to the forests. So all of this, as I expected, uh, I found is taking place at a very rapid pace. So that, uh, you know, that's what I expected to find and in my book, there are many, many cases that I discovered. But the more I studied this phenomena, I, I, the more I came to see that there was something else going on, something much deeper, more profound, and worrisome. And I've come to see this as a very profound, deep Darwinian struggle for the survival of the planet and the survival of the human race, a struggle for not only what remains of the world's resources, but for the survival of all the creatures that inhabit it. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about this evening, because that, that was what, what I found when I engaged in this project. This Darwinian struggle begins at a first approximation as a struggle for survival among the world's major corporations. These, especially uh, all of the oil companies, these and the energy companies, these are the richest and most powerful corporations ever created by humans, ExxonMobil, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, and their Chinese and Russian and Indian equivalents, the gi giant mining companies, the giant food companies, and all of the other commodities corporations, some private, some state-owned, some somewhere in between. All these corporations depend on having access to a steady supply of raw materials to, to uh, supply to in industry. And without them, they cannot exist. And as the supply of raw materials begins to shrivel, their survival is at risk. So they are engaged in a Darwinian struggle amongst themselves to gain control over what remains of these vital raw materials. And we see this kind of life or death struggle among them. For example, I saw that in the plight of BP after the Deepwater Horizon disaster two years ago, uh, that when it became clear that BP was going to have to pay tens of billions of dollars in claims and litigation over the damage to uh, the environment in the Gulf of Mexico and to all the fishing people and all those whose livelihood was its, at risk in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And they had to put aside tens of billions of dollars in a fund to um, make, make sure that they had the money for that. 
uh, President Obama demanded $20 billion be put aside in a fund for that purpose, uh, other corporations began planning to take over what they saw as the inevitable collapse of BP. ExxonMobil apparently met, also met with President Obama to talk about absorbing BP. Royal Dutch Shell met with British officials. It turned out that BP didn't collapse, but to survive, it had to sell off tens of billions of dollars of its prime assets, and the business press talk of vultures soaring around, uh, picking up pieces of BP at bargain basement prices. This is the kind of Darwinian struggle that I'm speaking about. I see it in many other ways in the mining industry, or if you follow uh, the fracking industry, the, 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 uh, or I should say the shale, oil, and gas industry in the United States, the, the most uh, dynamic edge of oil and gas extraction in the US. This was all developed by smaller companies, Chesapeake Energy and many of the others, XTO. All of these are now being absorbed by the giant companies like ExxonMobil and Shell, Total, and so on. And as reserves become, of resources become scarcer and, and scarcer, we're going to see this kind of the ch giant sharks eating up the smaller sharks and then the bigger sharks fighting it out. In these struggles, uh, as I say, some of these are giant private corporations. Sometimes, though, they're going to be governments backing the private corporations or state-owned companies getting involved. An example I have of this that struck me uh, was when Royal Dutch Shell developed the most promising new oil and gas field in Russia off of Sakhalin Island, the Sakhalin II oil and gas project. And when President, when Vladimir Putin became president of Russia, this, this deal was made under uh, President Yeltsin. When uh, Putin became president, he decided he wanted to take this over and give it to Gazprom, the monopoly state-owned gas company of, of the Russian state. And uh, if any of you ever studied uh, environmental politics in Russia and the Soviet Union, you'll know that this was not one of the uh, places where environmentalism was given high priority. But suddenly, uh, the environmental agency of Russia discovered a million environmental violations of Royal Dutch Shell. The company was shut down, and uh, Royal Dutch Shell was forced to sell its uh, major portion, its, its, its major share in the Sakhalin II uh, pr project to Gazprom at a $10 billion loss. Other examples of this, when, when uh, Chinese companies, state-owned companies like Sinuk, uh, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation, or CNPC, the China National Petroleum Company, or Sinopec, go into China or Latin America or Central Asia to try to get uh, assets, oil and natural gas assets, or Chinese mining companies go into Africa. China's now uh, all over Africa and Latin America trying to buy up uh, as much of their resources as they possibly can. The first person to, to go over there is the president or the prime minister offering all kinds of goodies, development aid, a new soccer stadium, new hospitals, or how about a new, uh, a, a new, a, a, a new army? Out, it will equip your army with a new round of tanks and artillery and jet planes, whatever you want, as a way of getting access, uh, getting a deal for allowing the Chinese companies to come in. So this is the kind of struggle underway. So as a second level of approximation of this Darwinian struggle that I see, it, this is a struggle among states, nation states, for what remains of the world's vital resources. All of the major consuming powers in the world today face a future in which there will be insufficient supplies of the basic necessities we need 
for industrial civilization, whether it's energy or crucial minerals, whether we're talking about you know, basic industrial minerals like iron and copper and bauxite and titanium or specialized minerals like rare earths and palladium and germanium and the specialized things without which industries can't work. There simply is not enough of these things. I'm speaking of non-renewable resources. There's not enough of these left on the planet to satisfy the needs of not only of the older industrial powers, US, Japan, Germany, and so on, and the rising demand coming from China, Brazil, India, and the other rising powers of the future, as well as a population that's expected to grow by a few billion people over the next 20, 30 years. The demand for resources of all these sorts is expected to soar, but the planet is not capable of supplying these if we proceed on an industrial path uh, like we've had for the past few hundred years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So every country will be in competition with all of the others for control over what remains of all of these things. And for political leaders, this will be an immense burden. How to satisfy the needs of our society, even if other societies aren't going to have enough. And increasingly, I see this as the dominant or one of the dominant concerns of presidential and prime minister and whatever, kings, whatever the nature of the leadership, this is their increasingly their, their dominant policy concern. I think this is one of the underlying themes in this presidential election. It isn't expressed openly that way, but, um, and we're not a, well, I don't know about, Maine isn't a swing state, but if you go to the swing states, Ohio and, and Virginia, you're bombarded with advertising from the oil and gas industry and the coal industry. Uh, you can't turn on the TV. It's, it's, all, it's nonstop oil and coal, 24 hours a day advertising uh, with the implication. It's, they, you know, under the rules, they can't say vote Romney and, you know, and so that the coal industry will, will uh, flourish and so on. But the implication is that the election, this election is about what our energy future is going to be all about. If you vote for Obama, our, the lights are going to be turned off in the future. And if you vote for Romney, you know, we're going to have a bright future with lots of new jobs and plentiful energy. That's what the advertising implies in those swing states. I might say more about this later. Uh, this is one of the underlying themes of this election. The biggest, adver the biggest contributors to the Romney campaign is the oil and gas industry. Biggest single contributors are the uh, Koch brothers who are in the refining business and in other aspects of fossil fuels because the future, as I'll say later, is going to be about how we're going to satisfy energy needs in this country and every other country as as non-renewable resources disappear. But let me give you other examples of this um, growing struggle for policymakers. Uh, here's the Russian drive to develop the Arctic. Uh, five weeks ago, I was in Vladivostok at the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, and I heard from President Putin speaking about the the, how Russia is going to boost its economic fortunes by developing Siberia and the Arctic to produce raw materials for Asia's economic growth. That's how he sees the way Russia's answer to the global economic difficulties we have today. Europe is finished, he said. Uh, the future lies in Asia, and, and we're going to uh, alter our economic engine, our economic plan, I should say, to produce raw materials for the thriving economies of the Asia-Pacific region. To do this, uh, he sees that Russia's future lies in Siberia and the Arctic region, 
where something like one third of the world's remaining natural gas is located, as well as immense reserves of timber and, and uh, uranium, coal, and cobalt, and other vital raw materials that are essential for the industrial expansion in Asia. So he sees his plan for uh, keeping Russian economy afloat is to supply resources to the Asian countries which lack resources and are desperate for more. I'm sure you've also read about the fighting between China and Japan over a number of islands in the East China Sea. They're called Senkaku Islands in Japanese, the Diaoyu Islands in Chinese, and everybody's scratching their head. Why are these countries almost on the verge of war over these uninhabited specks of rock in the middle of the East China Sea? Well, it's not over the islands. It's whoever control the islands controls the waters around them. And at the bottom of those waters are giant oil and gas reserves, deposits, that both countries want to have for their exclusive use because neither China nor Japan can satisfy their energy needs without them. That's what's driving the struggle there. Same thing is true in the South China Sea where China is fighting with the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia for control over the Spratly Islands and the Paracel Islands, which again are uninhabitable and of no use whatsoever. But they control the surrounding waters, which are believed to lie on top of giant reserves of oil and natural gas. Something else I write in my book that absolutely blew my head apart. The King Abdullah Initiative for Saudi Agricultural Investment Abroad. This uh, arises from the fact that Saudi Arabia, like other countries in the Persian Gulf area, are mostly desert. They get very little rain, and therefore cannot produce very much food for their populations, which are all growing very rapidly and are expected to see more population and less rainfall in the future because of global warming. So what are they doing? They are buying farmland in Africa, especially places like Ethiopia and Sudan, which don't exactly have well-fed populations, buying giant estates, walling them off, producing food, building airstrips, and flying food to Saudi Arabia so that Saudis will be fed in the future, even if people in Sudan and Ethiopia starve to death. This is the solution to future food problems. And not just Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and other Persian Gulf kingdoms. China is doing the same thing. South Korea is doing the same thing. And other countries. These are called land grabs. They are planning for a future in which there's not enough food for the world's population. And they can't grow enough themselves, so they'll buy up food farmland in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere uh, to, to feed their population at the expense of other people. I could give other examples. My point is that government leaders around the world are increasingly focusing on the struggle to ensure that their population has enough to meet the needs of their own population in a world where there's not going to be enough um, at the risk of others. Now, we know something about a world like this uh, from human history. Typically, this leads to warfare. Uh, in, I'm very much influenced by the, war, by, by the book Collapse by Jared Diamond. Some of you may be familiar with Collapse. Everybody should read Collapse by Jared Diamond. When you have a world where resources are insufficient to meet the needs of populations, and particularly at a time when there's climate change, which has happened in the past, uh, the outcome very frequently is violent conflict between competing populations for what remains. And this is what I fear is most likely going to be the outcome in the future, if we continue on the course that we're on. Now, 
I'll talk more about that. I don't think that's inevitable, but that's what history suggests we're seeing, we're going to see. And there's plenty of evidence that things are moving in this direction. We see this with the growing militarization of the Arctic, as the Arctic becomes more important as a source of energy and minerals and so on, and there are contested areas there. Russia is building up its Arctic military capacity, so is Canada, which has a large region there, as is Norway. Uh, we're seeing this in the increasing militarization of the conflicts in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. And President Obama, who I admire in some respects, I think is making a terrible mistake and choosing to, if you've heard of his latest strategic ploy, it's called a pivot to Asia. Uh, this is, instead of focusing on conflict in the Middle East, counterterrorism in the Middle East, the new thrust for American strategic policy in the 21st century is to contest China in the South China Sea and the East China Sea by building up our Navy to, uh, to support our allies, Japan and the Philippines and so on in the struggle over these offshore resources in the sea lanes of the Asia Pacific region. I heard Hillary Clinton talk about this just five weeks ago in Vladivostok. So this is, this is the direction in which many of the nations of the world are moving to increasingly militarize their pursuit of the world's remaining resources. So uh, that, that's what I'm seeing, this, this Darwinian struggle leading to greater violence, which of course has been the history of human behavior uh, over, over many, many millennia. And if, if um, Jared Diamond is correct, uh, we're going to see an increasing amounts of this, that, that, uh, that the combination of resource scarcity, climate change, and competition for resources leads to collapse of civilizations accompanied by violence. Um, now the question is, is that the only possible outcome of what we're going to see in the years ahead? Um, and, and I have this debate with my colleagues all the time. I don't think that's inevitably going to be the outcome because I think humans are very resilient and I see when I travel around many young people in particular seeking solutions, seeking alternatives to this kind of Darwinian struggle. So I think there are two trends taking place on the planet today. One is the race for what's left, which is the dominant paradigm, which is control, largely dominating the policies of the major powers, the United States, Japan, uh, Russia, and China, uh, for example. But there is another paradigm that's arising. I, I call it the race to adapt. Maybe there's a better term than that. But this paradigm says, looks at the Jared Diamond model and says that we still have time to adapt to a world of diminished resources and climate change and rising population by adopting an alternative industrial paradigm. And we have some sense of what that industrial, an alternative industrial paradigm looks like. Many of you in this room probably have some sense of what that alternative is. It's a paradigm that, that calls for transitioning as rapidly as possible from reliance on non-renewable resources of all kinds, not just energy, but also minerals and uh, many other non-renewed timber and so on, to uh, renewable resources of all kinds, uh, to a much greater emphasis on efficiency in the use of resources, the ones that we can't replace, we have to use much more, much more efficiently than ever before. Uh, making buildings out of replaceable materials uh, so that, and making them super efficient with respect to energy use and heating and lighting. This is possible. There are people working on this all over the world. This has to be 
uh, accelerated and made the center of future design, of urban design. We have to develop new transportation systems that don't involve moving around a two-ton piece of metal uh, powered by non-renewable materials. This is unsustainable. And uh, it's not just here that, that the worry is. In China and India, they're also building these two-ton, three-ton pieces of metal that have to be moved around by oil. And if, if that continues uh, to be the case, we're going to be in for a very tense couple of decades as we and the Chinese and the Indians and everybody else fights over a diminishing supply of petroleum. So we have to come up with an alternative paradigm and an alternative industrial paradigm that does not require uh, a Darwinian fight over the remaining supply of these non-renewable materials. And, and I, I, what I suspect is going to happen is that, that well, you could, you could see signs of this already. What I think is going to happen, that is, the, as we move into the future, you will see both things happening simultaneously. You will see this intense struggle taking place with a lot of violence and a lot of environmental catastrophe. But on the other hand, you will see uh, a further progress being made all the time uh, in many parts of the world in a alternative direction where uh, some governments some cities, some towns, some universities, some communities are moving to, to transition away from a unsustainable industrial paradigm towards one that is sustainable and that makes it possible for us all to survive on a planet that's going to be hotter and more crowded um, and where the, where the competition for resources will be greater. Uh, so it is possible to do that. But that process of adaptation is also going to have winners and losers, just as there are going to be winners and losers in the race for what's left. Those who make the transition first and who gain mastery of the new technologies are going to be the winners in the future. They're going to be the leaders who will uh, have the patents and the intellectual uh, leadership in how to make a transition. And those who resist making the transition ultimately will be the losers because their economies eventually will fall behind. So the conclusion I draw from this is that it's essential for people, forward-looking people who care about the future of their society and for their children and young people who care about the future in their careers to look very carefully at these two paths and to see how they can become a part of the future rather than cling to a, a past or a, a paradigm that has no future and is, is destined to bring us uh, in a very dangerous, destructive place. That is what this election, by the way, is all about, although that's not what I came here to speak about because it's much bigger than that. It's the fate of all of us on this planet is at stake in this choice between uh, the old industrial paradigm and a new one that has to be created. And I, I, we, I see signs of it all over, but it has to be uh, speeded up much more rapidly if we're to win a race with time, and that's the last thing that I'm going to say. Uh, there, we are in a race with time uh, because uh, the speed of warming is accelerating faster than we ever expected. The population is growing rapidly, and the raw materials that we rely on are disappearing rapidly. So uh, if we don't make this transition very soon, uh, the plight of most people is going to be pretty severe. There are solutions, but they're not being developed fast enough. That's where I'll stop. I, this is 
This is the conclusions that I drew from my own research. That's what I'm sharing with you. Um, I hope that you found them uh, stimulating and interesting. You may disagree with me. I'd love it if you um, question me about it, uh, uh, see where, I, where there are holes in my argument, uh, see, see, uh, see where, where I can be corrected in my analysis. I would love it if you challenge me as much as you can, ask questions. But thank you very much for listening. Okay, people now, uh, the, the, uh, the, the forum is open for questions, but uh, only those with a microphone in their hands are allowed to ask a question, so. So I was just wondering, um, potentially, how long do you think we have to make this transition? A decade or two. Well, let, I mean, th things are getting bad all the time, and progress is being made all the time. How much time we have before things get really, really bad, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know. Uh, but I'm very frightened by some of the things that I see happening like the melting of the Greenland ice cap. And uh, this summer was the uh, smallest ice, uh, Arctic ice cap ever. And we had the worst droughts in decades in the United States, but also a horrible weather, probably the worst combination of bad weather events ever in, you know, in, since scientific records have been kept. So there are a lot of things happening simultaneously that tell us that we have, we have to worry. And we haven't seen, the, we haven't seen the, the worst effects yet of this year's drought and, and the other droughts happening elsewhere around the world in terms of food shortages that are likely to occur as we get closer to uh, the effects are likely to be most severe starting around December, January. And it, there was a bad drought two years ago that triggered the Arab Spring. Now they're likely to be equally bad, if not worse. So we have to, we can, we can, there still may be consequences yet to come. I, I'm not, am I supposed to call people or are you doing with the microphone? How does this work? You guys with the microphone are, are choosing the candidates. Good. Okay. That's better. And I've been told that we're going to start with students for the first couple questions, and then we'll transition to Very open. good. Okay. Um, it seems that many people who push for renewable resources don't, quote, want it in their backyard. So what would you say to these people in order to get them to cooperate, and how would you prevent wealthy communities from, like, buying their way out of seeing something like windmills on their property? You know, I don't know what to say to them. How about, a, how about a coal plant in your backyard? Is that what you really want, or are you just being classist? You know, you're just, you're just using your wealth. Th those people don't want a nuclear plant in their backyard or a coal plant. Let's just turn off your electricity. I, I don't know what to say to them. You know, they want their electricity, and they want all their stuff. They want all their devices to turn on when they turn on the electricity switch. So they just don't want it. They don't want to have to deal with the consequences of it. Um, they would like a coal plant a whole lot less, though. I, I, I don't know exactly what to say to them. I'm sorry. Um. It seems in the book and in, in the race for what's left. I can't hear you. Could you start again? Yeah, sorry. Um, it seems in the race for what, what's left, three issues seem to arise, um, the financial, environmental, and moral issues. Do you think one issue takes precedent over the other? And if so, um, can we deal with it at a political level, or will it require a like cultural revolution to change? Oh, I should know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the that, that a cultural revolution sounds right in the sense that um, we have to learn how to uh, enjoy life 
with less stuff. So that is a cultural revolution. And I think that this is entirely possible. I, th I think we've lived in a society where if you turn on the television, which I find, uh, I, I find a burdensome activity, but if you turn it on <laughs> other than you know, public television, you're bombarded with very sophisticated advertising that implies that you need more in your life a new bigger car, a new bigger everything. And that has to be switched off. What we need is to think about happiness in a way with less, but more community spirit, more community amenities, more parks, more playgrounds, more public transportation. So it is a cultural revolution. This, I think, is certainly attainable. Um, I've just got a little drive around Portland, and it looks like a really sweet place to live in that it has more of that than you know, your average suburbia. Uh, but you know, so much of, of public, uh, so much of media and TV and movies has implied that if you don't live in a ranch style house with a three car garage and three cars and a yacht and a swimming pool, you're not happy. And this is very dangerous. It's not just in the United States. I have many foreign students in my classes from China, from India, from Korea, from Taiwan. And I don't know if you have here, but they all say that that's what they see on TV. And they want to duplicate that in their country. That is their aspiration, is to duplicate the American way of life, which they think is a, a giant house with three-car garage and a big American car. They tell me this. So the degree that we propagate that imagery, we're, we're, we're creating, a, you know, multiplying the destructiveness to the planet. Because we can't, the planet cannot provide that, not only for us, but for a billion and a half Chinese and a billion and a half Indians. It cannot do that. So we have to think about projecting other ways of living that are much more modest. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, you talked about the fact that we need to make changes. I was wondering, what kind of government do you think is most equipped to facilitate those changes? Do you think democracy is the best way, or does it require a more dictatorial sort of approach? I, 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 think, I think the best approach is one that's closest to home for, the, for as many decisions could be made locally, so that you, you know, that you, you localism, local, localized, decision making as much as possible to, to um, democratic government for as much as possible at the local level and then building up from there so that as few as possible decisions get pushed up higher so that people can get involved as much as possible in decision making that affects their own community. So yes, democracy. Uh, now, is what we have in this country democracy <laughs> is another question. I do not think that the decision uh, to, al to allow corporations free speech is democracy. That's not what the founders of this government intended, I believe. So that wouldn't be allowed in most real democracies around the world. And it, that, that creates too much power for billionaires. I want to see real democracy. Thank you. Your proposed solution to this problem of diminishing resources seems to boil down to two issues. Technology, build more efficient transportation devices and houses and whatnot. And then uh, secondly, moral, exercise some self-constraint. You don't need to supersize your lives as much. And uh, 
if things do get as bad as you and others are predicting, I'm myself rather skeptical that these two, either alone or together, are going to be sufficient. Uh, I think additional means will need to be investigated. Uh, stronger carrots and sticks, if you will, in politics and law. I mean, we, there will need to be regulations just saying, sorry, you can't use <laughs> as much of this resource as you used to, or, or only if you're willing to pay a, an incredible amount of money to try to discourage people. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm very, I, 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 you know, I, I don't have a complete answer to all of this. I, I, would be, I would be dishonest if I said I did. I, I do believe that carrots work better than sticks, by and large. So, uh, but I, I was careful. I, I talked about a competitive struggle between, uh, occurring, and that I think that those who succeed in creating the most effective alternative paradigms will prevail because that will be attractive to people and not and and, and so it, it whereas those who cling to an outmoded system will sink and people will abandon them eventually so that the 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 the, the uh, competitive race to adapt will favor, in the end, ingenuity, innovation, adaptation, smart thinking, new ways of doing things, that there will be benefits for those who make the leap. And that will push things forward. And you know, when you, you do see that, um, you see where, where that's happening in Germany, where they've really pushed things ahead, where you know you get uh, you get an incentive for installing a solar panel because you can sell electricity to the grid. You get money in your pocket for doing that. All kinds of incentives. So I'm in, I'm in, I I tend to favor incentives rather than sticks. I'm not saying I think you're necessarily wrong, but I I do think that I was going to say something else, but I'm not sure I can remember what. Um, but I'll, if I think of it, I'll come back. That, those are very important questions. Uh, I'm not sure everybody is going to make it. You know, I'm not sure the United States will survive intact in this future. I mean, I don't know how. When I say the future, I'm talking this, the, to the end of this century. It may be that New England, the Pacific Northwest, and California. California is about to start a cap and trade system for carbon permits on January 1st. It's, it's going to join Europe in being far more advanced than the rest of the country. And, and that's going to force the utilities and everybody else to adopt a, a, a German, European style advanced energy system. Whereas large parts of the Midwest, you know, and the South are, are still hooked on coal. So as things deteriorate, if I'm right about this, and I could be wrong, uh, you know, will the U.S. remain intact or will the successful parts break away? I don't know. There's no law that says this. I mean, there is a law, the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> but under duress, you know, under duress, uh, it, it, thing, it, there could be the, the less successful parts may, may, you know, may collapse. If, if some of the predictions are right about climate change, various parts of the Southwest may be uninhabitable. There may be no water. People will have to abandon those places. So, uh, but I do think other places will, will adapt successfully and people will flock to those places. Most, the, the most, uh, no, no, I won't go on. I'll come back to it if I think of more. Can you share your thoughts on how the national conversation 
on renewable versus non-renewable energy can be contested. Because um, what's striking, one of the striking things about this presidential campaign, I think as you hinted, is the lack of conversation about um, a renewable future. And as you indicated, so many ads that are dominated, not only by the oil and gas companies, dominated by the non-renewable equals economic growth equals jobs trope. But beyond that, I think there's sort of a paradigm that that's the only way that our country recovers. And, and you know, whether it's Romney or Obama, neither are saying anything that contests that dominant way to think about it. Now, I agree with you about localism, but there seems to be a need to have some national leadership. So how at the national level does that, converse, that, does that paradigm get contested toward a more renewable vision? I, 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 my, my answer has been, you know, was tried by President Obama in his first two or three years in office and either he didn't push it hard enough or it didn't get enough traction or what. So I'm a little bit at a loss, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, he talked about green jobs, and I think he made some bad choices, and they've come back to haunt him, so now he's shy about going in that, down that path. Uh, I still believe that's the right path to go down. I think the future is with green, green jobs. Um, I, I, th I think that the path of what I call extractionism, you know, the pursuit of ex extracting at, at all costs, will come back uh, to haunt those who pursue it, that the resistance to it will grow. But maybe people have to learn the hard way first. Uh, I think that fracking is going to be so destructive to the places where it occurs that eventually there will be a backlash. But it's not evident yet. This is this 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 is a false promise of a false fairyland, and they can't deliver on it. So, um, but maybe people have to find out the hard way. I I, I don't think there's an easy. I don't have an easy answer to that question. I'm sorry. I wish I did. I don't you know want to say that I can pull something out of the hat. I don't have an answer right this minute. Hi, um, I've been reading you in the nation for a long time. Um, I actually live in Pennsylvania, and I'm just fortuitously visiting Portland right now. Um, so did I miss? It, did I misinterpret what's happening there? Correct uh, me well, if I'm... on some level, it's actually a pitched battle between yeah, local, pitch battle. between local communities yes. and the Republican state government and yeah. governor, who have just recently agreed, for instance, a huge uh, deal of tax breaks and everything with Shell. Um, that's unprecedented in the in the state, um, and uh, at the same time, there's been court rulings that the Republican that the state government is not allowed to override certain local zoning right. uh, regulations. But that they're going to appeal are, that that yeah. are going to be able to give that could give local communities some control over what's actually going to be allowed. To take place in their community, but it, it's really on some level a, a pitched battle, like um, throughout the whole Marcellus Shale region, like in New York State and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, you know, wherever it extends. I forget how far it extends, but um, so I guess my question was um, that one of the uh, one of the arguments that's made to try to convince people that these kinds of things are good, like the XL pipeline and the fracking and all these other things is that, and drilling in Alaska and drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and, and so on, is that it's going to help with American energy independence. And this has been an argument that's around for a long time. And to me, I think that it's just a myth. And I <laughs> wonder if you could expound on that idea of each individual country competing somehow for their supposed energy independence in um, I don't know. Well, that's a, that's big a question. But yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a big question. I mean, the answer is it will not produce energy independence. You know, Marcellus Shale is producing mainly natural gas, and we don't import natural gas. We import oil, so uh, it's not going to solve our energy dependence issue. It is true that the um, 
the shale deposits in North Dakota, the Bacon Formation, or Bakken Formation, is oil. And maybe we'll get a million barrels a day out of that, and maybe a couple of million barrels a day out of Canada. So, you know, Canada is not the United States, but, you know, that's just a matter of time. Uh, so when you have to listen carefully to, to Romney's energy independence and our good friends in Canada and Mexico, it's really North American energy independence he's talking about, not North American energy independence, not U.S. That's not within reach. It's within reach if the U.S. extends its borders and we get all of Mexico and Canada's oil. That's, you know... Um, we, we will, uh, I, I don't know where to begin. Um, there's no way that we could achieve oil independence if we continue to consume 20 million barrels of oil a day or 18 or 19 million barrels a day. We're still going to have to import six or seven million barrels a day. There's no way we're going to get more. We can't. So that's out of the question. Canada may give us two, 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 three million barrels a day in tar sands. I am of the opinion that in time, all of these things will, that, that none of these things will reach the exalted levels they're said to reach because they're so dangerous. They're so environmentally dangerous that one way or another, they will fall short. They need a lot of water. And there isn't enough water to satisfy, to, 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 to support fracking and tar sands production and food production. There isn't enough, and there will be less in the future. The tar sands is acidic. You know, they talk about all this wonderful oil coming from Canada, but it's not oil, it's shit coming from Canada. Oh, they can't put that on the air. It's crud. It's crud coming from Canada. It's this acid. It eats through the pipes. And it's only a matter of time before there is some disaster. Um, and the process of producing it in Canada is horrific. So it, it'll never reach what they claim. I get very upset about this. So it's, uh, if you re read, oh, read Romney's energy plan, uh, it, it, it talks about, to achieve it, we're also going to have to develop an energy council with Mexico in which um, the U.S. and Mexican authorities will collaborate in developing rules for production. In other words, we're going to rewrite the Mexican Constitution. That's, behind, you know, that's what's implied by this. When they find out this is what the Mexicans fought revolution about. They're not going to allow this to happen. So the whole thing is imperialist and cockamamie. It, you know, it, it's, it, it is so, so off the wall. There, there's no way of achieving energy independence, even North American energy independence, unless we cut back on our use of oil, which is not what they're calling for. They, they want us to burn more oil. So it's, it's a, it, it is a recipe for increased energy dependency on the Middle East and Africa. If that wasn't clear, uh, I, I, I'll be happy to <laughs> do it again. I'm so, <laughs> and try, try, I'll try to do it more clearly, and I apologize for my frank description of Canadian tar sands, <laughs> if I offended anybody. I was interested in your comments about your students that come from Asia yes. and how they are looking when they leave home, they see life as a television show with the three cars in the garage. Yes. When they get here, do they see something different and do they take that difference back home with them or are they so intent on getting the education to get themselves the three cars that they miss that? Very interesting question. I don't know the answer. 
I, I do think they see a much more complex picture than they came here with. Uh, um, they don't know about race, for example. The complexities of race in America is not something they know about, uh, or, or poverty. So I think they do come back with a very complex picture, but I don't know the answer to your question. It's very interesting, yeah. Um, actually, I have one statement and one question. The first statement is that um, everybody in this place should know that the Canadians are trying to ship tar sands on the pipes straight into Portland, Maine. Oh, so, yes. Thank you for reminding me. And they're horrible, acidic things, and whatever word you used. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my uh, question is this. I'm... I, it's since I think we are a culture of stuff, and because everybody says to improve the economy, you have to have people having more money so they can buy more stuff, which means more people have to make stuff. How, how do we balance this people needing to have a way to make a living and the idea that making a living requires the acquisition of stuff, and then this future that you uh, give us. I, I, I'm not an economist, so I don't know, but it seems somewhere there that there's a major conflict. And it, maybe it's the cultural shift that she was talking about back there. Oh, that's so complicated, and probably people in this room better than I equipped to answer you. I mean, on a mega scale, what's happening is that this society is being depleted of wealth per capita as other societies are rising. Um, and so uh, what, what we expected when we were growing up as what, what, what would be expected way of life will be increasingly deprived of successive generations, the amount of stuff that that future generations will have will be less or it'll be crummier. It'll, it'll look the same maybe, but what's inside of it will be much cheaper materials and quality, and it'll be a facsimile of what we once had. And it'll cost much less to produce and it won't be produced here anyway. Uh, so, and the incomes that people will have will have less, and they'll be able to go to Walmart and buy cheap, crummy imitations of what we once had or aspired to. I think that's what's happening. And the economy, but I'm not an economist, but I, what I sense is that, that uh, the people who control the economy are designing it so that a small, fewer number of people acquire more and more of the rest of us have less and that that's, that's acceler that process is accelerating. But other places in the world, more and more people are acquiring more, and that's a historical process. And I don't know what to, do, what, what to say about that. However, um, that creates resentment and grievances. And politicians exploit those grievances. That's what Mr. Romney is going to try to do tomorrow night. You know, is exploit the grievances that you don't that you know we're on we're, there's so much unemployment, there's so much suffering in America, and throw the bastards out, and I will deliver. What he'll deliver is an acceleration of the dis enrichment of of working people in this country and the middle class. But he'll he'll exploit the grievances. And I worry about that because of what I, because of the resource competition that I see with China on the horizon. That that's another theme that I see. You know, that we are in a resource competition with China because China is going in the other direction. Average Chinese has, for the past 25 years, seen an upward increase in their standard of living while we've seen a kind of average decrease. And I think that will continue to be the case. 
But for that to continue, uh, China will need more of what uh, will have to prevail in the race, you know, more, we'll have to have more of what's left in the race for what's left. And that will lead to competition with the US. Uh, we have been, for example, the world's leading importer of oil for since World War II. Or no, for the, well, since 1950s anyway. And American foreign policy, I believe, has largely been dictated by our reliance on imported oil. That's why we fight wars in the Middle East. That's what I believe. Now, what happens when China is destined in another decade or so to need more oil than we do, imported oil than we do? And where are they going to go? There isn't anywhere else to go except the same places we go, Africa, the Middle East, Venezuela, a few other places. And I don't see how that can't lead, unless everybody changes their behavior, to a clash. So that they can fuel their cars. And I worry that politicians will exploit this situation uh, to, to rise to power. You know, those bastard young Chinese are taking your oil and pushing up the price and, the, and wrecking your quality of life. Vote for me. You know, I'll stand up to them. I'll build up our Navy. I'll contest them in the Middle East. There's a hint of that in this election already, but I think it'll get worse. That's what worries me about this larger equation, which is why I, I think you know, the conversion to away from non-renewable resources is essential for avoiding you know, global catastrophe. So I'm sorry it took so long to answer that, but I, I hope you see how all this fits together. I want to say, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, I thought of what I wanted to say to you before. <laughs> Could you give me one second? The thing about non-renewable resources is that the ones, in many cases, they are in contested places. Because they're in contested places, nations increasingly rely on military means to get them, and that leads to militarism, to dictatorship, to authoritarianism. Non-renewable resources, by and large, don't come from distant contested places. They come from your roof or from, hmm? Renewable resources, I'm sorry, come from your roof, from your tidal, estuaries from your rivers or windmills, and they, by and large, escape this militaristic dimension of non-renewable resources. So there is a way in which they escape some of the hierarchy, the authoritarianism, the um, you know, militarism that non-renewable resources throughout history Ar armies were invented for the purpose of procuring resources. That's what armies were invented for. Land, water, food, minerals, trees, slaves. Armies are created for the purpose of acquiring resources. If you don't have to go someplace to get them, you don't need an army or a you know, you could follow from that. Uh, this is sort of a wishy-washy question, I think. This but, whole wishy-washy thinking here <laughs> where we're engaging in, so that's all right. I, uh, I agree with you that, that things need to be done on a local level, but on the other hand, um, the idea that, that small sort of British anarchic model communes uh, can wield any power uh, in a world in which there are armies in which those locally driven uh, organizations, if they become successful, are going to be taken over by those armies anyway, I think is something of a pipe dream. 
that in, in, the, in the age in which corporations are allowed to speak and, and individuals like the Koch brothers are allowed to spend unlimited sums, um, re really changing the world, it seems to me, depends on changing the Koch brothers. Um, how do we do, how do we get those that currently have the power and seem to be able to control that power for the immediate future anyway, to start thinking in more longer terms? Um, because while we build our little communes that aren't going to last, uh, they're continuing to wage war. Uh, I, you know, obviously I don't, not, not going to be able to provide a, a pat answer to that. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I think you underestimate, the, I'm not talking about a little commune, I'm, I'm talking about uh, cities like Portland, Burlington, Vermont, states like Washington State, and California that have, you know, fairly substantial, Germany, fairly substantial economies um, that are experimenting with alternative ways of doing things. I'm not saying they're all perfect or they're all going to succeed or not. I'm, I'm just saying that they're, they're moving, they're, they're, they're looking at, 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 at alternative ways of doing things. That's, so there's that. Um, Basically, I think th you can't change the Koch brothers. You have to create alternative civilization around them that is more successful, and that will happen. Well, will it happen in time on a large enough scale? I can't guarantee that, but it will happen. Their, their mode of doing things is doomed. Will it you know, how long will it last? I can't say, but it is doomed. And more and more people will catch on and will want to go on the other railroad, you know, on the other train. So it's a matter of building the other railroad or whatever and getting started. Hi. Um, what types of green technology do you think we'll see more of in the future, given that some green technologies require non-renewable resources to make? That's a very good point. I talk about that in my book, about uh, the reliance on rare earths uh, and other uh, non-renewable materials. So I, I would be very interested in, in things like um, experiments developing Algae is a fuel because that's something that can be done uh, without lots of non-renewable resources. There's some very promising experiments with algae and other other uh, designer bio biotechnology fuels. I, I, it's probably too early to know where that's going to go. Uh, that would be one example. Um, I think new materials, I mean, it, it should be possible to build vehicles out of super strength plastics and the like that need much less fuel. Uh, so that, I would be looking at new materials, new building materials. Don't have to make a building out of the material, timber and other non-renewable materials. And I know there are places around the world where a lot of experimentation is being done on that. So that's what I would be looking at. Hi. Um, there's a prototype right here in Portland where people can uh, obtain goods and services from their neighbors. And it's called the Hour Exchange, H-O-U-R, where one hour of my time, say as a uh -huh. cake baker, is equivalent to one hour of somebody else's time who does plumbing and so forth and so on. And um, these hours are uh, pr um, through the web, the internet, are put in a bank. 
and uh, say, I, say I provided two hours of financial planning to someone. Um, I then would have two hours in the bank, and I could, I could hire somebody else who is in the hour exchange to um, give me singing lessons, uh, and so on. So th this, is, um, this has been going on here in Portland for a long time. In fact, someone from Britain, whose name I can't remember, came to study this, this uh, program. And there's, uh, there's some, my friend Stephen Beckett is the webmaster. And he knows how many of these our exchanges there are now throughout the nation. I, I, I want to say 73. But it's local goods and services being provided um, without people having to get in their cars and driving, you know, 300 miles or whatever. It, it harkens back to the days, well, when I was a, a little girl on the farm, we had uh, harvesting in the community where the big threshing machine was moved around from farm to farm and everybody helped everybody else. So the idea of community uh, being reborn, revisited, and everybody wants community anyway. It's our, it's our largest need. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking now. I Yes, well, I, I, I've been alluding to all of this in my comments. So th this is an, a, an example. Burlington, Vermont has a similar system. Berkshire County in Western Massachusetts has another version, Berkshire dollars. So there are many, many experiments of this kind. And this is what I'm saying, that these are still small scale, but I think in time they will grow in importance and, and sort of web together somehow. So thank you for that. I, I wanted to say in, in response to the last question that you asked, uh, I know that there, there's work being done in the main coast to tap into tidal energy. And I think that's very promising. I know it's at a very early stage, but I, if I were somebody who is looking you know, long term, I would be paying very close attention to that because I think there's a lot of pot a lot of potential in tidal energy and wave energy. They're doing that off the coast of Oregon and Washington State because uh, there's a tremendous amount of power in tides and waves, and I'm I'm convinced that people will figure out a way to tap into that energy. Not yet, but in time they will. So that's, that's something else I would look at. There's a question here, too. Unfortunately, this is the last question. Oh, I promised he oh, could ask okay, one. Well, then there's another, we'll make an exception then, if you promised. <laughs> Um, I know you spoke a lot about getting the younger generations involved, and um, that's something I'm an environmental major, and that's something we talk a lot about is getting the younger generations involved. But for a lot of younger people in my generation, we almost feel at a loss to get involved because of lost hope. Almost is there? Excuse me. Is there any suggestions of of like how to get more involved for that? Well, I don't know what you mean by involved. Be you know, there's activism. It's Maybe as far as governmental, because a lot of this is governmentally run yeah, or constructed. Well, I, I'm not very optimistic about the prospects at the national level. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that people be involved in Washington, D.C., but I, I think there's much more promising work going on at the local and state level. So, and there is a lot of very good work being done at that level. So I, that's what I would say, find projects at the local and state level where there's a chance to really make some headway and work there. Uh, the other thing is uh, that I would say is to get involved in learning about very practical solutions that are, that are you know, on the cutting edge and how to you know, be part, participate in, in designing, developing, implementing very practical things. I just, I just wanted to. I, I, I just, I, I always think of things after a minute. I, I, in answer to the last question, to your question, uh, 
something else that uh, my home base is Hampshire College, and we have a new president, uh, Jonathan Layash, who used to be at, at the head of the, the um, World Resources Institute, and he, he, we, he's now our president. And, and one of the things we're talking about is how to make college campuses and university campuses laboratories for the development of sustainable economies and saying that every college camp campus could in some way play a leading role in developing some of these new technologies or experimenting with them. Um, it happens that Hampshire has a farm, so we've decided that we're going to make sustainable agriculture kind of the theme for our college and a lot of students teaching, but also the food that we eat, serve in the cafeteria, and international projects and so on that may not be appropriate here. But that's something else that you could think about. How can this university and other universities play a leading role as a laboratory, a developer, an experimenter in trying out new technologies that can then be adapted on a larger scale by towns and cities and so on? I just, uh, I, I was, this paradigm shift that you mentioned early on in your talk, I, I have a book sitting on my desk. It's called Perspe Energy Perspectives by Ruta Silly from 1973. If you look through the table of contents, everything that we talk about in 2012 is exactly what we spoke about in the year 1973, before I was even born. So I, it, it, it seems to me that when you're talking about renewable energy in particular, it's always that holy grail that we have yet to obtain. Even in, even in the president's uh, January State of the Union, he was touting natural gas and oil production in yeah. this country that has, is, is high, higher than it's been in, what, 16 years. And that was one of his major platforms to expand offshore oil production. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 the fact is, even though some of these, some of these resources are, are, getting, are, are harder to get, they're dirtier, they're nastier, they're also extremely energy dense. And you always have that battle between the non-renewables the, the non and the renewables that in your 10 to 20 year, you know, perhaps change, and then you're talking about tidal power that can take 40 to 50 years to, to come to fruition. You're talking about a very tenuous time that it just seems problematic to me at least, uh, to, to see how you can have an easy transition, um, or if a transition at all. Well that, you know, I don't know what to respond to that. Probably in 1973, global warming wasn't on the horizon. Um, China wasn't on the horizon as a major energy consumer. India wasn't on the horizon. So the situation today is very different. Uh, What's changed in my mind, what I learned in writing my book, I didn't talk about that tonight, is the disappearance of conventional oil and gas and coal. So there, is more, there are more fossil fuels, but everything that's left is, is what the industry calls unconventional oil and gas, meaning it's the crud of tar sands, this, you know, the industry prefers not to use that stuff because it can't be refined into oil in its natural state. It has to be treated with all kinds of chemicals to make it usable at all at great expense. And you know, getting oil out of shale rock is exceedingly difficult and hazardous to do. They wouldn't do that if they had any choice in the matter. And deep offshore and so on and so forth, all of this is what you do when you're desperate when you're you know, an addict and you're desperate to do anything to get a last fix. So we're, that's the situation we are in today. We're not in the same energy situation we were in 1973. We're in a much more desperate condition. And these people are determined to preserve a paradigm that's already well beyond its peak of, of operations, of, of, of uh, economic viability it can only be sustained through very extreme measures of, and dangerous hazardous measures of operation for which to make this possible, um, I use the term third worldification. 
The only way they can make this possible is to turn the United States into what we used to call a third world country, by which I mean uh, eliminate all environmental laws, eliminate local democracy, which they tried in Pennsylvania, which th this gentleman was talking about before, uh, bribe and corrupt local officials, um, and you know, erode popular democracy by elections, which they're trying to do this time around. That's what they used to do in the third world. They can't get away with that nearly as much in the third world. They can't do that in Venezuela anymore or in many other places in Angola and so on. Uh, so they have to do that here. So it's a very different picture than it was in 1973 as I see it. And therefore the stakes for all of us are much, much higher. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.